Hello Hearts of Iron players, my name's Riemann, and today I want to jump into the eternal debate of what combat width you should have your divisions at. I've done lots of tests, both in theory and in practice, and overall it's pretty clear to me that 40 width is superior. However, I want to give 20 width divisions their due, and so in this video I'll show you all the pros and cons between the two width types because there's a lot more differences than you might think. I'll explain the benefits 20 width divisions have over their larger counterparts, and show you some situations where they can be better. Then I'll explain the benefits of 40 width divisions, and how those advantages end up overpowering their smaller brethren to such a degree that I'm confident in saying 40 width is just outright superior in most instances. Before we start digging into the differences between the two widths, I need to first mention that a lot of this video will be digging around the core of the combat system, so things will make a lot more intuitive sense to you if you understand how that works. I made a video guide last week that goes into all the details you'd need to know, which I have on screen right now, so you can check that out if you've never bothered to learn or if you need a refresher. I'll try to mention all the important results that are pertinent as I'm explaining things, but if you want to see the logic behind them, then that video is a great resource. Also, as I'm explaining things, note that everything applies to 22 and 44 width divisions as well, if you have the trait that reduces combat width. Moreover, the 20 width explanation can be magnified and extended to 10 width divisions if you really want to spam out as many tiny units as possible. Alright, now first off, I want to go into the ways 20 width divisions are better than 40 width, because it's not an all or nothing situation. There are definitely some places 20 width divisions are just the best choice. The number one advantage they have is higher organization. The way a division's organization is calculated is based on the average organization of all battalions. Things like HP, Defense, Breakthrough, and Soft and Hard Attack are all additive, but that isn't the case for organization. A division made of one infantry battalion will have 60 organization, as will a division made of 25 infantry battalions. And from the video I made last week, you'll know that damage to organization is applied directly to the base value. In other words, it will take the same number of hits to deorg the 1 battalion division as it will take to deorg the 25 battalion division. In both cases, it would be around 8,000 hits, but then you could simply spam out 25 of the single battalion divisions to have 25 times the organization. As you probably know, organization is very important because it represents your division's staying power. Whichever side runs out first is going to be pushed back. Whichever side is being pushed back is going to lose factories and resources, and eventually, the war. Higher organization can also allow you to use some of it to merely prolong battles, to stunlock units, or get more bombings done with your air force. Organization is very powerful, and so an advantage in that area should not be underestimated. The other big advantage small divisions have is the pretty obvious one of more flexibility. Your frontline has more granularity, and so you can be more precise with your attacks and how you allocate your defense. You can have 20 width protecting a static area, 60 width attacking a certain province, and 100 width defending a recently taken strategic point, like an important city or airbase. All these situations are ones that 40 widths wouldn't be able to mathematically achieve. They'd have to devote more units to less important areas to simply have guys there, which would take away from units they'd have to send to other parts of the front. As for how this works in practice, I'm a bit more skeptical because usually I just have my infantry set to the front line, so the AI handles most of my allocations, and I think most players are the same. This means a precise allocation isn't typically much of a factor as you might think. However, more divisions definitely comes in handy on longer fronts. If your enemy can't man the entire front with at least one division, you can simply exploit the few gaps to push them back at no cost. This either forces your enemy to retreat, to not be encircled, or to start attacking you to stop your uncontested advance, which only ends up deorging their units, which can quickly cascade into a full rout. I've used this strategy many times when advancing into the USSR. As the front naturally expands, and after I've encircled many of their divisions, I can start advancing with almost no casualties if I micro things properly. Granted, I've basically won by that point anyways, but the advantage exists nonetheless. This sort of advantage becomes even more pronounced in low supply areas, which is pretty much everywhere outside of Europe. Supply values are quite low in a large portion of the world to an extent that smaller divisions are almost necessary. Granted, those parts of the planet don't typically matter that much, but it's something to keep in mind. 
Then, another possible advantage that I've heard of players using but haven't used myself is the ability to keep rotating divisions into a fight as they lose organization. All divisions in combat will lose organization, but if you keep some behind the front, you can use their swift recovery rate to keep a battle sustained almost perpetually, at least in theory. Next up, another benefit 20 with divisions can bring is less wasted defense. If you remember back to the video I made last week, defense is useful to block all the shots the enemy makes, but anything beyond that is useless. As it turns out, defense is one of the easiest stats to stack to extreme heights. If you're playing a defensive nation that's strapped for industry like Czechoslovakia, making more divisions lets you be more efficient with your industry allocation by maintaining the max bonus while spreading your units out to maximize coverage. There are three other minor benefits to having smaller divisions. The first is that they take less army experience to make. You will save 35 XP by sticking with 20 width, and since army XP is at a premium early in the game, it might not even be possible to come out of the gate with 40 width divisions. The second minor advantage is that I've heard field marshals can gain more experience towards leveling up if they control more units, although I didn't bother verifying this since army commanders are going to change soon with the Waking the Tiger expansion. Finally, the third minor benefit is that two 20 with divisions could pack in two support artillery instead of one, and since support artillery has no combat width, this will increase their overall soft attack value such that two 20 with divisions will have a higher combined soft attack than one 40 width. Although, as you'll see in a bit, this benefit hardly proves decisive and is, at best, mitigation for their lower combat potential. Now I want to get into the benefits of 40 width divisions. The first and biggest advantage they have is that they are simply better at fighting given how combat currently functions in Hearts of Iron 4. If you remember back to my previous video, there were two important conclusions about how attack values function. The first was that each point of attack value that exceeds the enemy's defense or breakthrough is four times better than a point of attack that doesn't, and the close corollary was each additional point of attack is better than the one that preceded it. You want your attack as high as possible to really shred through enemy divisions. There was one last part about combat I didn't explain in my last video, and that was target acquisition. In other words, when in combat, what are your divisions actually shooting at? Are they shooting at all enemies equally? Are they picking one enemy division at random and only firing at it? Can multiple divisions pull their attacks to overcome the defense of an enemy to deal more damage? Or is everything a series of 1v1s? To deduce what actually occurs in battle, I set up an experiment where both sides have two divisions of equal soft attack, defense, and breakthrough, and I had them only deal organization damage so strength depletion wouldn't impact the combat equations. Then I ran the divisions at each other and recorded how much damage they did to each other over a period of time, and using the damage equation I uncovered last week, I found results that could only be consistent with the following. If a division is attacked by multiple enemies in an hour, the enemies effectively do pool their attack and are thus able to overcome the defense of that unit even if they couldn't do so individually. However, each division picks a random target every hour and deals its full damage to that target alone. And if any of you doubt me, Podcat confirmed that's how things work about a year ago. So in other words, in this battle you see here, both my divisions are randomly picking targets. 50% of the time they'll pick different targets, which both have enough defense to counter all attacks, so my divisions will only have a 10% hit rate. But the other half of the time, my two divisions pick the same enemy and thus combine their attack values, meaning half the attacks exceed the one enemy division's defense and end up having a 40% hit rate, and thus do quadruple damage. Okay, so how does this apply to 140 width versus 220 width? In this example, I've equalized the defense and breakthrough of infantry, so it won't matter if they're on offense or defense. Then, I included some support artillery on each division to increase soft attack. When you compare the 40 width versus the 220 widths, the 40 width has slightly less soft attack since the 220 widths can both bring support artillery, and it has about half the organization. However, it has the benefit of the combat mechanic that each division only picks one other target each hour. The 40 width will use the entire force of its soft attack to overcome the defense of one of the enemy divisions to the point that nearly half its attacks will deal quadruple damage. The 220 widths pool their attacks together but cannot overcome the breakthrough of the larger division. Hence, the organization damage done will be 6.96 per day to the larger division and 15.42 per day to the smaller divisions. 
By focusing its attacks on one target at a time, the larger division is able to overcome the double organization of its adversaries and end up winning every conflict. Then, if I re-enable strength damage, at the end of the battle the casualties are 668 on the 40 width side to over 1590 on the 20 width side. This was with equal defensive stats, and the 20 width side even had more soft attack, and yet it took well over 2 to 1 casualties due simply to how combat works. There's no upper bound to the amount of attacks you can pile up on one enemy, and it keeps getting better and better the higher you go. You can see the 40 width division takes advantage of this much better than 20 widths ever will. While this is the single largest advantage to using 40 widths, it's hardly the only one. Larger divisions also allow for more efficient use of support companies. First off, they simply need less to get the same impact. A full bevy of support companies like this on all your divisions will lead to two 20 widths costing 25% more industry than one 40 width. Given that industry is the main limiting factor in this game and that this is across all your divisions, that's a significant cost. Second, the support companies dilute the overall division less while still giving their full impact on the 40 width. This is especially apparent with things like organization, armor, and piercing. Speaking of which, another benefit of larger divisions is they make more efficient use of armor and piercing values. Piercing is calculated by taking 40% of the value of the battalion with the highest piercing in the division, and 60% of the average. So if you wanted to include a heavy tank destroyer on your 1941 infantry, you would get 62.2 piercing for the 40 width and 64.3 piercing for the 20 width. The piercing difference between the two widths is barely two points, and is effectually meaningless since both of them can comfortably pierce a 15 tank and 5 motorized armor division with ease. But of course, the 20 widths would have to make twice as many heavy tank destroyers to get this same benefit, and by replacing one of their infantry battalions, they would lose a greater portion of their HP and organization as opposed to the 40 width where one infantry battalion means quite little. Moreover, this phenomenon carries over to armor values as well, which take 30% of the value of the highest battalion, plus 70% of the average. Attaching a heavy tank destroyer would give you 36.3 armor on the 40 width and 38.4 on the 20 width. Again, the difference is barely 2 points, and there are no critical values you would hit with the 20 width as opposed to the 40 width. In either case, your enemy would have to counter you with anti-tank weapons or their own tank destroyers. They couldn't get away with cheap anti-air in either case. The only difference would be that the 20 width would once again have to make twice as many tank destroyers and dilute their divisions more than the 40 width. There are three other minor benefits to running bigger divisions. The first is that they have a better reinforce rate. This one is minor because the reinforce trick exists as I explained in my previous video, but if you can't use that then you'll find that larger divisions only need to pass one reinforcement check to bring the full impact of 40 width into the fray as opposed to two. 40 widths also requires less micromanagement, which can be a significant factor in multiplayer and can preserve your sanity in single player. Finally, they can make better use of generals as their commander rather than using field marshals. Generals gain experience 8 times faster than field marshals, and since they are limited by the number of divisions instead of battalions, they could command about double the amount of troops if you go with larger division sizes. So with all that in mind, how do 20 wits and 40 wits balance out? Are 20 wits dead? I don't think so. Not at all. However, I would say that 40 wits are my preferred size, and it's what I'll shoot for when I'm designing most of my army, assuming a normal game where I can have a reasonable amount of industry and resources, and I'm fighting in a location that matters, which is to say, Europe. I will always try to have my tank divisions at 40 width, since tanks are hella expensive and extremely useful. By running them at 40 width, I can make them as efficient as possible and ensure I have enough breakthrough so that I can swap out some of my dedicated tanks for self-propelled guns to start racking up that soft attack. Once you're satisfied with how much protection they have, your next and only other priority is speed. You want to give your enemies as little time as possible to react to what you're doing, so you need to be quick. And when I'm talking about speed, I'm not just talking about how fast your units move. I'm also talking about how quickly they knock the organization out of enemy divisions to get them out of the way. Running them at 40 width allows them to knock out enemies ASAP by preferential targeting from combat mechanics, and by running more attack-oriented battalions like self-propelled artillery. But tanks aren't the only divisions I run in my spearheads. I also use 20 width motorized. 
Too often, I see players thinking they can only run one combat width for all their divisions, but that couldn't be further from the truth. If you've never done so, you should try mixing things up because 20 width motorized combo really well with 40 width armor. The main point of trucks is to be quick troops standing in the way so the enemy can't just walk out of the encirclement uncontested. The reason I run these guys at 20 width is several fold. First, they're not meant to engage enemies, they just need to be in the way. Since defense is so easy to get high values on with things like entrenchment, 20 width is typically all I need to stop the disorganized divisions in the pocket from escaping. The second reason I run them at 20 width is so they don't suck up all the supplies, which are usually pretty sparse behind enemy lines. Finally, I run them at 20 width so they can fan out to easily capture undefended enemy land. If I have more trucks than I need to seal the fate of the pocket, I'll send the rest of them in the other direction to just see what they can take by driving around. More divisions means more land taken this way. Overall, I prefer 40 width to 20 width since they are just better in combat to a significant degree. I do run several divisions of 20 width, but my overall total army composition skews heavily towards 40 width in most of my games, and I need a good specific reason before I would change it in a campaign. Those reasons do exist, but they're typically for minor nations looking for quick defense. If you want to expand in this game, you'll need to go out and attack other nations, and when you do so, you'll find that if two forces engage each other with equal stats, but one side is organized into 40 widths, they'll have a significant advantage due to how divisions target each other in combat and how defense and attack values work together. Hence, 40 width divisions are just overall better. That's all for today. My name's Riemann, and until next time, thanks for watching.